Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Warren Hogue, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations, and I'm happy to welcome you to this policy forum on the impact of counterterrorism measures on humanitarian action, sponsored by IPI, Norwegian Refugee Council, NRC, and the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OSHA. We are here today to discuss an independent study of the impact of donor government counterterrorism measures, excuse me, counterterrorism measures on principled humanitarian action. Copies of the executive summary of the report are in your seats, those of you who have seats, and on the credenza on the side there for those who don't have seats. Let me start by telling you how and why this report came about. In early 2011, in response to growing concern among humanitarian actors about some disturbing consequences of international and national counterterrorism measures for humanitarian action, an interagency standing committee working group asked NRC and OSHA to commission an independent study on the issue. OSHA and NRC commissioned a team of independent researchers to carry out this study, and it was launched in Geneva two months ago during the humanitarian segment of ECOSOC. <clears throat> the study looks at the impact of laws and measures of donor governments on humanitarian action. It is intended as a constructive contribution to an issue that is of concern to humanitarian organizations, donor governs, governments, and public opinion. The study found that the policies and measures that flow from donor counterterrorism laws often have tangible impacts on humanitarian actors and action. For example, in some cases, humanitarian organizations have become less able to support people located in areas where designated groups may be active. Increased administrative procedures for procurement or vetting have limited their ability to provide assistance and protection in accordance with humanitarian principles. The reaction to counterterrorism measures has also been characterized in some cases by risk aversion and self-censorship within the humanitarian organizations. The report's key conclusion is that the humanitarian community and donor states need to work more closely to better reconcile counterterrorism measures and humanitarian action. And this should take place across all relevant sectors within government, security, justice, financial, and humanitarian, as well as between states and the humanitarian community at both headquarters and field level. To discuss the report, we have what the Sunday talk shows on American television like to call a powerhouse roundtable. First to speak will be Kyung Wah Kang, the Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Deputy Relief Coordinator. I first knew her in the days when I was the New York Times United Nations correspondent, and I was interviewing an aspiring candidate for the UN Secretary General's job, whom she was promoting. His name, of course, was Ban Ki-moon. Today, she's going to talk about some of the key recommendations in this report. Next up will be Jan Egelon, the Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugee Council and a former Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs. He also is an old friend of mine from my correspondent days because Yang was a, was a frequent interviewee for me on subjects like the UN's work in Darfur and in the aftermath of the 2004 tsunami. Since I've been, the time I've been here at IPI, I'm often asked by UN officials to advise them on how to better get the UN story out there, how to get the story from the UN with real impact out there. And I frequently say, follow the example of Jan Egelon, uh, who successfully managed to call attention to the UN's work by telling the unvarnished truth and by doing so in eye-catching and vivid language. It was irresistible to those of us who were reporters at the time. 
And then we'll hear from Jean-Paul Laborde, a frequent and welcome participant in IPI events, who is the Executive Director of the Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate. So with that brief introduction, I'm happy to turn this over to kyung Hwa Kang. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Warren, for this, uh, for this occasion, and, and thank IPI for hosting this event. Uh, I'm delighted to be uh, here as my first engagement with IPI under my new job as ASG in OCHA, which I started just about six months ago and still on a learning curve, and, and so you'll excuse me if I slip on some of the, the details of our work. But this really gives us an opportunity to start a dialogue which was the fundamental goal of this, this study to begin with. There was a problem out there for humanitarian that needed to be discussed and discussed with key partners and stakeholders, donor governments, other humanitarians, civil society actors, member states and UN agencies. So re I really appreciate IPI for giving us this opportunity to have this dialogue, which indeed is, is a key recommendation of this independent study. I welcome in particular to do this in the presence of uh, Jan Egeland, a former emergency relief coordinator and USG of OCHA. Um, his name in the corridors of our office still reverberate with great resonance, so very honored to be here with you, uh, Jan, today. Um, NRC and OCHA collaborated in co-commissioning this independent study um, on behalf of the Interagency Standing Committee. Um, and it is particularly important to have civil society perspective on this issue because one of the key findings of the study is that Different types of humanitarian actors, UN or non-UN entities, larger or smaller organizations, secular or faith-based NGOs, these are all very differently impacted by counterterrorism measures. I, of course, also welcome the presence of Mr. Laborde with us, the new executive director of uh, CTED. Um, and, and we're very much committed to working with his team and other other entities, member states, and other parts of the United Nations systems to sh ensure that a appropriate balance is struck between what is the legitimate security aims of counterterrorism measures and the aims of principled humanitarian action, which is to deliver for people in need. I think we would all agree that there is no inherent contradiction between these two sets of objectives. Indeed, at the most basic level, both share the aim of seeking to protect civilians from harm. But humanitarian principles dictate that assistance and protection be directed only to relieve the suffering of those in need and not to support the efforts of any party to armed conflict. Humanitarian principles require that assistance is based is provided on the basis of need only, and that no other criteria should be taken into consideration. Humanitarian organizations need to be able to access conflict and disaster-affected people, regardless of their ethnic, social, political, or other background, and irrespective of whose control they are under. This study is about the impact of donors' relevant laws and policies on humanitarian action and the way the humanitarian actors have responded to these. It is not, it is not intended as a commentary on the broader need for or legitimacy of counterterrorism operations or activities. There is no question that states have a legitimate right and indeed responsibility to protect their civilian populations from the often horrific harm caused by acts of terrorism. But it is important to note that the study does not contend that counter-terrorism uh, counter -terrorism measures are the only, or indeed the primary, obstacles to effective humanitarian action in all contexts where designated groups are active. In such situations, and there are many, the impact of counter-terrorism measures must be always understood in the context of a range of other security and logistical constraints, which are often related to the activities of the designated groups 
themselves. The study has found indeed that in some cases, donor counterterrorism measures have had negative impacts on humanitarian action. And while such impacts differ in nature and intensity from one context to the other, they have included halts or decrease in funding, blocking of projects, suspension of programs, planning and program design not according to needs, delays in project implementation, increased administrative procedures for procurement or vetting, and limitations on financial transactions. It must be emphasized that none of the laws examined in the study actually prohibit humanitarian organizations from having contact with groups designated as terrorists. However, policies that inhibit, not prohibit, inhibit engagement and negotiation with armed groups, including those designated as terrorists, can prevent humanitarian organizations from reaching people in need of assistance and protection, particularly in areas such as the OPT, South Central Somalia, where entities designated as terrorists, either by the Security Council or by individual governments, are in effective control of territory. In addition to these direct impacts, there is indirect impact of counterterrorism measures and the way that humanitarian actors have reacted to them. There are the lack of clarity around the content, scope, and application of some counterterrorism measures have contributed to an environment in which humanitarian organizations implement self-censorship and coping strategies as a response to counterterrorism measures. There is a critical need for the open policy dialogue that this calls for. And in the interest of initiating this dialogue, I would like to propose here some initial thoughts on four priority streams of work upon which this dialogue might focus at the initial stages. And these four would include, first, counterterrorism components of funding ar arrangements, two, humanitarian exemptions within counterterrorism laws and policies, three, measures to mitigate the impact of financial regulations on legitimate humanitarian activities, and four, stronger risk management measures within the humanitarian sector. Firstly, there is a pressing need for a more open dialogue between donors and humanitarian actors regarding acceptable parameters for counterterrorism clauses within funding agreements. The study found wide variation within the sector on this point, and also found that on many occasions, humanitarian organizations have entered into agreements with language that might compromise the impartial provision of assistance. And while it is perhaps not realistic that such a dialogue might conclude with a single standard clause across different donors and different kinds of humanitarian organizations, greater transparency will help all actors to judge acceptable levels of risk and to determine appropriate language that fits the mandates and legal regimes of donors and humanitarian organizations alike. Such a dialogue could, as a starting point, aim at identifying and replicating best practices that already exist. And I'm very happy to report that the IASC task team, co-chaired by OCHA and NRC, has begun examining this issue. Secondly, humanitarian actors should work with states and intergovernmental organizations to ensure the inclusion of appropriate exemptions for humanitarian action in counterterrorism laws and policies in order to allow humanitarian actors to meet humanitarian needs. In particular, national or international sanction regimes should provide for humanitarian carve-outs, that is, exceptions within the regime providing for the delivery of humanitarian assistance to people in need, including not only the direct provision
terrorist attacks. And the unintended consequence is that it has been more difficult to help civilians, women and children in the crossfire, uh, refugees displaced in some of the worst corners of the world. That has to be changed because it's also one of the foremost duties of politicians and governments to change the way they act when there are unintended consequences. Now, I think, uh, <clears throat> as was, uh, was just uh, said by Kyung Wa, and I'm so happy that OCHA and the Norwegian Refugee Council is, 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 is doing this together. I think really there are three reasons that we are in the mess that we are at the moment uh, in, in terms of counter-terrorism measures leading for organizations like my own to, to, to have problems in helping the most vulnerable. Number one is that the, 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 the uh, parliamentarians, the Congress people who initiated these general policies did not know that when they translated through ministries of treasury and, uh, and, and, and interior or homeland defense or whatever, through a state department or a donor agencies down to the NGO, it, it, it had often totally <laughs> counterproductive effects. And it has to be revisited. Um, the, the, the net example, I think, and I will, uh, not really much time here, but I, I would, uh, would argue one case where I think there are many counterproductive effects of it, seen even with counterterror uh, uh, ICE. And it's not just the United States that is doing this. It's most of the Western donors, it's the Gulf countries, and it's other donors. And they all have different policies that translate into very cumbersome procedures that make, and here's my second point why it's, we're in, in this problem, humanitarian uh, groups, agencies have not stood up to the fundamental humanitarian principles of impartiality, neutrality, independence. They have not had the backbone they should have had. And we have not collectively defended some of the organizations that have been most vulnerable. Islamic humanitarian groups that I remember in, the, in my uh, earlier times in the UN, we really tried to foster because we really needed to be less Western in, in terms of funding and in terms of I, uh, pu public uh, and local face. Third reason we're in this problem is that we're not talking together. And hopefully this study can be, can be at the beginning of that. We have to sit down and we have to ask each other, donors, are you really sure that your procedures, dear NGOs or UN agencies or whatever, are you really sure that you're monitoring, uh, checking, evaluating, uh, auditing, uh, vetting in all uh, fashion so that you know that none of your relief or, or, or assistance is going into the wrong hands? And the NGOs have to say, are you really understanding that these procedures are now leading us to do bad things uh, for, for very vulnerable people? I mean, there are some inter interesting examples here. In, 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 in part, they come because some groups are really over, are, are just very scared and do uh, very extreme things. Uh, groups would leave, you know, southern Somalia when we needed them the most to help starving people because they're very, very afraid of, 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 of doing something wrong in a complicated, complicated set web of, of measures that were, were, were enacted to avoid this awful group, Al-Shabaab, becoming stronger. But the point was, the, 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 the Al-Shabaab victims were doubly victims because they didn't get uh, uh, enough relief either. Another favorite example of me is how, read it, two kindergartens in Gaza did not, uh, were, were, a, a group discontinued 
food distribution to two kindergartens because the headmaster was seen as leaning to Hamas. So I'm asking you, when did a baby become a Hamas baby? A baby is a baby. That's the whole purpose of humanitarian work. A baby is a baby. And it needs food if it is hungry. Here is also the counterproductivism, in my view. If I then was a Hamas leaning, and I now take off my humanitarian hat, but I take on my sort of uh, political analyst hat. If I was a Hamas leaning father, having my children as a as a kindergarten, I was not getting relief because the headmaster was seen to be Hamas. I would not become more moderate and more liberal and more democratic. I would become very angry, first and foremost, very angry. It is counterproductive. The NRC, uh, my own organization, has this week had to reject money from one of our best donors, best donors that was supposed to go to um, go to w water and sanitation projects in the biggest refugee camp on earth, which is Dadaab camp for Somali refugees in Kenya. Why did we um, re uh, refuse uh, that, to, to take that important money for us and for the people? Because we're asked to vet and hand over biodata, hand over biodata for all of our employees and partners and others involved in the project, which is something our board prohibits us to do because it would be precisely the thing that would threaten our overall work in this refugee camp if we are seen as, as basically uh, working with and acting on, on behalf of, uh, of a foreign government. It is, is exactly the thing we cannot do as a, as a, as a humanitarian uh, um, agency in a very, very sensitive place. Now, um, I think we need to be better in explaining all of the safeguards we have to avoid that any of our relief and action goes in the wrong direction, that we ever do the mistake of, 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 of supporting any political or other group. We have multiple safeguards against that. We know that if we did that, irrespective of it was West or East or North or South or Christian or Islamic or, 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 or Jewish or whatever the group, we would, end up, we would end out of business. The whole purpose of our work is to have quality control in this. I think we need to explain that, and perhaps that will lead us out of all of this. Um, as we're now heading into Syria with more relief, the, the, the biggest challenge for the humanitarian world now is to do more, more work inside of Syria, where we're doing far too little as a collective humanitarian community. There is no place in Syria which is not run by bad people at the moment. I mean, it, it's, whether it's the government uh, doing chemical arms and, and all sorts of other bad things, or uh, all sorts of opposition groups doing bad things with bad leanings. You know, do we want to have a system that makes it triply difficult for us to go into the place and help the poor Syrians? I don't think so. So uh, the, the conclusion, read the conclusions, is basically, let's sit down and talk. We need to talk. Donors, which were best friends, who helped us become what we are, and we as humanitarian groups, so that we can avoid unintended consequences for the most vulnerable of people. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, Jean-Paul. I will not start with the legal approach, even if I was for a white judge in my Supreme Court concerning the different cases, that, because it's not a question of, of uh, let's say, uh, only legal, and then this, is, this is the point. This is uh, helping the poor, as you said. And I'm very grateful to uh, IPI to have uh, asked the, uh, me as a representative of the counter to his community, I would like to say. Uh, to be part of your of your meeting. First of all, of course, nobody in this room, and uh, the contrary, everybody in this room, sorry, and uh, including the presenters here, 
and uh, you recall that in your speeches, your presentations, uh, knows that uh, we have to work on counterterrorism. It's not in this, in this country, in these particular months, after the 11th of September that we had a few days ago, that we should say that. General principles. I think that this is what was said by uh, the predecessors uh, in, in this uh, overall presentation. It should not be any contradiction between humanitarian, uh, international humanitarian law and counterterrorist measures, at least at the international level. Well, for once, let me propose that we start from the international level to go down to the national one. Because if we have something to do, and it is uh, visible here today, we have to start from the international momentum and then in filter the national, let's say, uh, uh, authorities. And you did the same, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and then in filter the national authorities with this type of conscientiousness of this complementarity. First, uh, even when we speak about international law, when we go back to the, conven the Geneva Conventions, somewhere, may I recall that, we have also, as a war crime, the crime of terrorism. Mm -hmm. Yet, it is not defined, but still, it is there. So it means that from the founders of the international humanitarian law, this is something which has to be fought. Together with, and this is where I start from, together with the international humanitarian law measures. So the principle also is that you, everybody knows that uh, I come from the country of Montesquieu. You know, why not to, to envisage an international rule of law uh, perspective in which you have all these components? This is where we start from. Even the Security Council, in its various resolutions, has considered, for example, that and it is one of the principles I want to underline, that, of course, terrorist action infringes the right of the life of people in the world. And, of course, the, the second principle is that we should work to protect all the civilian, civilians from harm. So the challenge is, of course, uh, since uh, the, the devil is still and always in the details, if we can speak about details here, is about Resolution 1373, which say that prohibit, you know, uh, any organization to, uh, uh, let's say, give funds to uh, uh, terrorist organizations, almost that. First of all, I feel that uh, if it, it, the, the, this problem was well, uh, let's say, envisaged in the report, but still I felt uh, there was still, um, uh, let's say, a way of getting out of that problem in circumscribing more effectively the, the work, I mean, uh, what is a terrorist organization in the context, and it is something that we can be interpreted in the resolution 1373, in, co in, the, in connection with the, with the crime of terrorism, not with terrorism in general. That's something that has to be probably one of the ways on which we have to discuss, and something also that uh, we should probably instill in the uh, uh, national legislation. This is the first challenge and one of the solutions which is possible. Well, the second point is, uh, I'm very, let's say, easy on that since it is my job, is uh, the, the problem of the intent. And the problem of intent is that, uh, of course, uh, when you give funds, OCHA, NGOs, etc., two uh, organizations which can be considered uh, as a, a terrorist organization, do you have the intent to provide funds not only to the organization itself, but to the organization with the intent 
to help this organization to commit a crime of terrorism. That's the point that we also should discuss, okay? Of course, there is no intention in, um, I mean, uh, in any uh, uh, of your uh, humanitarian organization to help, I mean, sorry, to give funds to this organization with a special intent to commit crime of terrorism, to commit a crime of terrorism. It's uh, to, as you said, Jan, is to help the poor. That's what uh, it should be, and probably it is a second step also in which we could work, uh, in the direction of which we could work, because it means that if there is not intent to, to give these this funds to this organization uh, to commit a crime of terrorism, it should not be prosecuted somewhere. You see what I mean? So this is where we have probably to discuss and, and to, uh, to, find, uh, to find the possibility of, uh, uh, of, of doing uh, a job, um, I mean, a good job together in order to facilitate your, your work. Well, uh, my colleague from OCHA said increasing the dialogue, and Jan said the same. Yes, we have to. But we have, we have started uh, doing that already in the, in the country to his executive directorate since, in many cases, we invite uh, the, uh, uh, we invite OCHA or the other humanitarian uh, uh, organizations to participate to our meetings or even to our visits to countries. You know, the work of CITED is mainly to assess the situation in a country and to provide recommendations to the Security Council Committee on what should be done. Then, of course, we have to take action on these specific uh, aspects and we will be more than happy to have even more, let's say, uh, involvement of the humanitarian organizations in, uh, in this area uh, of work. Well, of course we can say that the counter measures are not good enough, etc. But I still pose a question, I want a little bit to tease you. What have you done up to now to include this humanitarian perspective in counter measures? That's also something that we have probably to change because I can see that there are many hesitations of the humanitarian law people, you know, to be involved with us because of this label that we have on our shoulders of counter-terrorism people. So we have really to work on this issue mm -hmm. and uh, try to have this type of uh, uh, good approach in which we can invite, why not, for visits, or CHA or other organizations working on, the, on this issue for, uh, for the visits of, the, of these countries to get the advice on this balance. This is something that we really have to envisage now. So there is another point also. I feel that when the, the, the uh, I mean, this, uh, L, I mean, these difficulties arise, we have also to see when it is too tricky to, and when also it is not possible to uh, place it or in, 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 uh, insert it in a law, we have also to refer to the judge time to time. You know, when, the, when it is really bad, when the, there are some difficulties, you might also have cases in which you have to see how to deal with practically on the ground. So, I feel that First, it is my conclusion here, we have still to look into the matter uh, with a, a common approach, because even in the, all the Security Council resolution, we have the mention of international criminal law, uh, sorry, international humanitarian law. Uh, we have also within the international humanitarian law this approach of uh, terrorism as a, as a war crime. So we have really to, uh, to have this dialogue about how we can fine tune all of that. Concerning the, the, the FATF, I cannot speak about, I mean, uh, on, on their behalf, but I know also that they are trying to now uh, approach uh, the humanitarian, uh, to have an approach on humanitarian uh, international law. Uh, that's uh, on the dialogue. The second point is still to probably uh, revisit uh, the uh, criminal legislation to be more, let's say, 
to be clo uh, for this legislation to be closer to the crime of terrorism rather than to have let's say a, a broad a broader perspective perhaps i don't know but it's something that we can still uh, look at when the organizations are really linked to and and when the funds mainly are really linked to uh, the uh, uh, to the the funding of terrorist acts by themselves that's probably that also something that we have to do uh, in uh, having the humanitarian actors involved uh, eventually in some visits in the countries in which uh, there is some uh, difficulties. And um, with that, um, I feel that uh, I probably launched some ideas on the, on the table. I know that I might be considered as a bad guy in this audience, but still I am trying to do the, to do the, to do my job properly and be sure, rest assured, that the main purpose of what we do is not to have in place counterterrorism per se. We have always to, and then we always keep in mind that we are working for a sort of international rule of law in which these principles are particularly embedded. Otherwise, what counter-terrorist measures mean if you are not trying to support this type of international rule of law, which is always a dream for a criminal lawyer? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I well, thank all three of you for throwing out so many ideas, and I hope we get some good response from the audience. I would love to get questions and comments. Uh, if I see enough hands, uh, we'll do three at once. We'll start with the gentleman here in the second row. Do I see any other hands? Uh, Ambassador of Somalia, thank you. Second, uh, all, and then in the back. So we'll go one, yeah. two, three. We'll take all three questions at once, panel, and then answer them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, George Andreopoulos from the City University of New York. I would like, first of all, to thank all the presenters for their remarks and for OCHA and the Norwegian Refugee Council for undertaking this study. I have several questions, but I'm go going to ask only one at this stage, and this is addressed to Mr. Egeland. You mentioned about the role of parliamentarians. Now there have been studies after studies demonstrating how little often parliamentarians know about the laws that they are voting upon. And, uh, um, you know, uh, there is clearly room there for improvement. In the context of your remarks, what I want to ask you is, what should we be doing to ensure proper and more robust due diligence on the part of parliamentarians in this context? Because, of course, one obvious answer is that if there are bad laws, to go back and revise them. But the thing that I'm most interested in is what we should be doing proactively in this area. One idea possibly would be to have some kind of a provision whereby any kind of future counter-terrorist legislation cannot be submitted to parliament without some kind of an impact assessment study as to its humanitarian implications. But I would be interested in hearing more from you. How can we make due diligence more robust for parliamentarian bodies? Excellent. Keep that. Ambassador? Just wait for the microphone if you want. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me. Uh, Would you please introduce yourself so they know who you are? I'm, I do. Uh, Dr. El Midwale. I'm the permanent representative of Somalia to the United Nations. Uh, I'm, I'm very much impressed, really, by the presentations. And as usual, I commend also the IPI for always giving us the opportunity to be the opportunity to be able to express our thoughts and also to criticize as far as possible even what the panel says now i I'm, I'm, I'm not going to criticize anything <laughs> by the way but i am i appreciate really the presentations made and this i think this pamphlet here the executive summary is very, very enlightening and should be read by everybody. Governments, donors, um, humanitarian uh, people, all, all of them should read it. Um, unfortunately, it includes also, as was mentioned, 
was mentioned that in some cases, and this happened in Somalia, where areas that were controlled by al-Shabaab were practically excluded from any humanitarian type of, of, of assistance. Now that, and sometimes maybe al-Shabaab were also uh, in a way to blame because they, in some cases they had preferential treatment. They were accepting some and refusing the other, others. So that also created a, a bit of a problem. You now, that have been said, and I hope the, the recommendations made in this book or in this pamphlet or in this study should be really studied by everybody. Governments, parliamentarians especially, because of the legislations that are involved, donors, and of course, humanitarian uh, groups. Another th thing which also I feel has to be also tackled in the case of Somalia is that, uh, as you know, the where Somalis have in their, at the diaspora, there are so many Somalis who remit, make remittances to their families. And these remittances are in magnitude, but are ma, 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 much more than the total amount of, do, of donations given or assistance given. And now in many countries, these are kind of uh, prohibited. Yeah. So, and that is another thing that if people, if I want to send to my own grandmother or to my mother or to my, I can't send anything, even $100 a month. That, that these are areas that has to be also tackled, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. And in the back of the room, yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Hilda Klemstal from the Mission of Norway. Um, thank you very much for this discussion. We think it's very important and we are uh, quite concerned about this, this as well. Uh, we think it's a timely dialogue and discussion uh, and also important for us to have a discussion on, on the humanitarian principles that is not just theoretical. Um, I was wondering if, if Egelan and perhaps also Ocha could say a little bit more about concrete consequences that you are seeing in the field, in your work in the field, uh, possible consequences also for the funding, you mentioned some, and if you also see some consequences for, for the funding from our side as donors. Thank you. Well, Jan, I think the first question was directed at you about parliamentarians. Could I ask you to respond? Well, um, I've never been a parliamentarian, but I've often uh, spoken to parliamentarians. And, um, and due diligence in parliaments vary a lot. Uh, and at times it is very difficult. Uh, for, example, for example, in the kind of a heated moment, after a horrific terrorist attack against your country, of course parliamentarians feel the, 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 the demand from their constituents, this is democracy after all, to react against it. We need to defend ourselves here. We're at war with terror and all, all of that comes up. What I'm more, um, and in a way, I, and in that moment to really calm down, let's give it a lot of time, so it's difficult, but we have to try to, 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 to calm things down and get as much due diligence as possible. What I do not understand, however, is that you, know, you revisit this two or three or four years later and say, what are the consequences, intended and unintended, so le and let's, let's correct it. So if you ask, say, uh, you know, British or French or, 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 or Danish or US or Australian parliamentarians, you know, did you know that what you enacted three years ago has made it difficult for us to build latrines in Dadaab camp? <laughs> because we are not willing to get, give the CV of all the latrine diggers, to put it in there, uh, because it's ridiculous, number one, and number two, it looks as if we're a tool of a special corner from this world, which is not necessarily the most 
uh, uncontroversial in, in the region. And the problem is, of course, we didn't know that. We, we didn't want that. And of course, we didn't want food to be taken away for children at two, two schools that were seen to leaving at one particular Islamic group, because we know it is counterproductive if we want <laughs> to avoid these children growing up so angry that will go into extreme. Of course, we didn't mean that. And we will correct it. And we will correct. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, as much as we appreciate your comment, Ambassador, I didn't actually hear a question, but if any of you would like to comment on the Ambassador's statement, uh, if not, we'll go on to the question in the back of the room, which I would throw open to uh, the other two. If you, good, if you would speak to it, that would be thank, right. Thank you very much. Let me give you a very concrete and recent example on, 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 on the funding aspect of activities on the ground. And I won't name the country or the the host country or the funding country, but it is a concrete example. As you may know, we OCHA manages uh, the SURF, uh, the Central Emergency Relief Fund centrally here from New York headquarters, and that is uh, given to UN entities. But where there are big humanitarian crises, there are what are called country-based pooled funds. Uh, and we have these in a, a dozen or so countries where the needs are great and, 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 and humanitarian actors on the ground need funds uh, to carry out activities. There was a recent uh, pr uh, offer of a significant uh, sum of money uh, for such a fund in a particular country. Uh, but uh, with a funding um, agreement that included a clause that would have a flow down obligation uh, to the, our grantees, the local NGOs basically, uh, putting an obligation on them to vet uh, that their beneficiaries will, were, were not terrorist or, or associated with terrorist organizations. I forget the exact language. But that if we had that agreement and implement that obligation, we would lose all of our partners on the ground. Uh, and, and nobody would ask for these uh, funds if uh, it was an obligation on them to undertake this process. So we argued back. We said we cannot accept this money if, we, if this clause uh, stays as, as is. Uh, and initially, it was very difficult. But in the end, we were able to resolve this difference. We were able to come to a clause that was acceptable to us, both here at headquarters and, 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 and on the ground. So this, this cl clearly demonstrates that you can resolve these issues through dialogue. Uh, and this, of course, meant that the funder government had to go to their parliament and, and convince their parliament uh, about. Uh, so, you know, this, it, this, this kind of thing triggers dialogue, uh, both uh, with the funder and, and us, the humanitarian actors, but also within governments and, and, and if, uh, between the executive and, and, and the legislative. Jean-Paul. Yes. Uh, no, what is useful, and I, I just mentioned that, uh, we had visited already uh, 100 countries in the world, and now we are starting to have a follow-up on these visits. The visits that we had in the countries, which are, by the way, visits, uh, let's say, uh, requested by uh, the CTC, means a body of the Security Council, so it's very official visit. So we re among the other, among the, the, I mean, the issue that we visit, we, we look at, sorry, uh, it's all, it, always we visit, we, we look at the legislation, the country's legislation. I wonder whether during this next, uh, let's say, round of visits, if we have uh, volunteers from the, I mean, from the ones who have already been visited, we, um, uh, we could uh, count on the, for example, OCHA, because then we will, t we are talking with parliamentarians uh, concerning uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, I mean, the legislation, the counter legislation, et cetera, et cetera. So what you addressed, uh, dear colleague, mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, we can address that together, either you come with us or uh, if it is not possible for whatever reason, a reason of mandate or whatever, I mean, in order not for you to be seen as also there is also this question of approach and appearance, uh, at least to give us uh, some elements 
recommendations, etc., that uh, should be put in the legislation. That's, mm. that's what the, a very concrete approach that we can have. And this is why I said that, uh, please, don't cry. We should act together. <laughs> Otherwise, it will not work, OK? Now, th I feel that this is where we should really work together. Uh, you said, well, we need a new legislation. Fine. We can find a way, probably, uh, in the next rounds, so probably it will take some time, but uh, to to have this type of uh, new uh, new legislation in place with the humanitarian international humanitarian law exceptions. I, I, I welcome this. I, I think perhaps the way is that either OCHA or ICWA or Interaction. I mean the the umbrella organisations that are there, either within the UN system or or and the Interagency Standing Committee and so on, has to say, let's sit down, some donors, people like you who can then facilitate perhaps also proposals, and then we talk, we explain that the present way it is, it, it is counterproductive, um, bad uh, human humanitarian work, uh, and it leads to, to, to the most ridiculous things. And it's unintended. Uh, that's what, 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 what we understand. But somebody has to do it, I think, behalf of many of the more vulnerable groups. Uh, I already read, you know, one of it is a case here of an NGO very afraid of touching something that could lead to something. You know, what is material support to terrorism? You know, is it, is it, is it building a school uh, that uh, someone would uh, potentially use or, or, or take over or whatever? So this NGO asked a legal firm to, for advice. And the firm said, ooh, we don't dare to advise you on these things. I mean, it, it is a little bit uh, toxic, <laughs> the, whole, the whole thing in some places. And we need to detoxify it. Yeah. And those who are the most vulnerable, of course, are many of the Islamic groups uh, that are in a very difficult position. And, and the ambassador also mentioned, of course, the unintended consequence also that, you know, for, for him, it's difficult to send $10 to his aunt. You know, it, it was also not really the, the intention of, 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 I think, all of this. It was to, to undermine Al-Qaeda, uh, you know, and their attacks. Thank you. I'd love to get some more questions. Just raise your hands and I'll, I have um, Teresa, first of all, and then a woman in the back. And if I have a third, and a third right here. Uh, Marvin, if you'd begin with Teresa Whitfield. Thank you. Uh, Teresa Whitfield from the HD Center and the Center on International Cooperation at uh, NYU. Teresa, put a little closer to your mouth. Thank Sorry, you. is that better? Yep. Uh, first of all, thank you to IPI and the panelists and this initiative, which I've followed from afar. It's really struck me in the past working on both issues of humanitarian and political engagement with uh, groups that some people called armed groups and other people called terrorists. Um, and also following the CT debate at the UN. I've been to various events here at, I, at IPI, and in some of them you'll have the CT crowd, and in others of them you'll have the humanitarian or the political crowd, and I am quite often the only person at both, probably with EJ as well. So, um, and I have always been struck by the incapacity, even within the UN system and even in formats more informal than this, to have this kind of cross dialogue. So I think that's hugely important, and I'm actually very encouraged by hearing what Mr. Laborde and others have been saying moving forward. I have, I've also had conversations with some of the donor governments concerned about, about the legislation, and my worry, and I wonder how moving forward, what the plans are, for the kind of rollout and advocacy based on, on this report. This is really my question, but it isn't something that's very easy to answer. Because, of course, we all know many very decent officials within these governments, parliamentarians, but also in the executive, who will say, yes, the law is a mess. I've had it particularly in the US on the material support legislation, which affects those of us who work on mediation and political engagement. They'll say the law is terrible. But I, I agree with you entirely, but we can't touch it because politically, domestically, rolling back even patently faulty counterterrorism, I'm not, not saying any particular legislation is faulty, but for <coughs> individual governments to roll back counterterrorism legislation in any way at this moment 
is politically very difficult, even when they have some of the faults pointed it out. Point out. So I wonder what what sought to use this excellent report and initiative, and whether it's possible for this community to to move forward together in addressing some of these questions on an advocacy basis. Thank you. Thank you. In the back of the room. Thank you. Uh, Kagan Ann, Charity and Security Network in Washington. Can, can I ask you to speak up a little bit and hold that very close to your mouth? All right. Kagan Ann, Charity and Security Network in Washington. I wanted to ask uh, about the uh, approach of these problems being unintended consequences, which may have been the case early on, but uh, I think enough of the consequences of these policies has been made clear to people in government over the last four or five years at least, um, and it seems that there's more a problem of getting political will for making change and that educating them on these consequences in and of itself may not be enough. And I'd like to uh, ask for your thoughts on how to uh, create that political will to revisit the law. And finally, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ip Peters and I'm the permanent representative of Denmark to the United Nations since six weeks ago, so it's pretty new. Um, thank you very much for the very interesting uh, report and very useful report and for the, for the comments made. I think uh, um, we can definitely uh, you know, uh, support uh, all the recommendations. Um, and I think actually, um, but I think also representing a government uh, that we need to, and I think Mrs. Khan uh, actually talked a bit about the balance um, uh, I mean, there is a reason why all these measures have been introduced, and we need to keep that in picture as well uh, all, uh, all the time. And I know it's difficult to discuss what has been prevented, actually, what has been the so-called positive impact of that. Uh, so that, that needs to, and that's why I think you, your suggestion, one of your <laughs> recommendations to, um, uh, to really uh, get a dialogue between uh, government officials and the organizations get transparency on why is why why do we have these regulations and 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 could we and then sometimes maybe everybody would agree that makes sense but then let's try to, to how we can work with them in a better way so dialogue and closer uh, contact and i definitely echo what you're saying uh, under some kind of umbrella arrangement so get so uniform principles and practices as possible around the world is is very um, uh, important then i think another part with was also one of your uh, suggestions uh, uh, to work a lot more on the risk uh, assessment and risk management in in uh, in this, and this is something we have done from the Danish side and worked a lot with uh, uh, also with the UN in Somalia, um, and there we also need to have the parliamentarians in, so it all goes into a circle. But but uh, you know it's it's easy, and a lot of governments would see, say that right now we need to take risks going into these uh, countries and assist the poor. But when something happens then, and WFP had a problem a few years ago, then there's quite often a strong reaction from the same parliamentarians. So we need to work much better, I think, uh, and I would like to also hear how you, uh, you, we can work together in, uh, in, uh, with the UN organizations in analyzing the, the risks uh, ex ante uh, before you go in, in monitoring constantly and communicate constantly about there's been a change uh, in the game here, and, and you have to be aware that this might not end up as we had uh, expected, and therefore we are taking these and these measures right now, uh, and, and have a lot of transparency around that as well. And this final point, uh, Mr. Laborde, you talked about uh, look at the intention and, and, and so on, and I think that's, uh, I'm not a, a law student by background, uh, but I think it's, it sounds uh, uh, like a good idea. But, but there is a, a concept that we work a lot with in development cooperation that money is fungible. So you can say uh, it's, always, it's not always enough uh, because the, clearly there's nobody who provides funds for organizations like that with the intention of supporting terrorist actions. But they will make other funds free for other activities for the same organizations. So, I mean, it's a bit more difficult uh, than that, but I definitely echo that. Uh, let's try to look closer into that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. That's hard to sort all those elements out. They were so interesting. But I'm going to start, Jean-Paul, asking you. There are two things. Like to One is the gentleman's comment at the very end there, the Ambassador's comment, and also uh, Teresa Whitfield's point about the difficulty of pulling back on counter-terrorist legislation. Yes, it is very difficult to pull back. But it should not be seen, I mean, 
as a pullback. First of all, we have to see what kind of action have, uh, has to be taken. Then, of course, uh, when you go back to a country, you say, ah, you have to tell, we have, probably we missed these points before. Uh, and it is, by the way, linked to the issue of the intention. I think that uh, we should work on that. But we should not work in the limbo. Uh, I have something in mind. Probably this dialogue what, uh, about which uh, Jan uh, was speaking just before that should materialize in something more concrete at the end. means that why not to have a, a kind of uh, a guideline or something like that or good practices, uh, booklet, uh, for, on the basis of which we can go back to people, uh, to parliamentarians, etc., who is also, uh, uh, of course, the study and the impact and all of that. But still, you know, we need to have a, and let's say a reference, uh, uh, a kind of reference somewhere, in which we can combine these uh, these uh, uh, these elements. I am not sure that the countries want to go back. Uh, this is not the point. The point is that how we will go there. I said I can offer to go whenever the country the country wants to have a follow up on the on the uh, uh, and see what we can do. That's. A very modest approach, you know. We should not jump to to the other step already. I say, okay, you want to follow up on what has been done. Okay, we have a visit normally. Then after the visit, uh, there there are what we call the an assessment of what is needed for the country. So, and among the things which are needed is legislation. Probably the easiest way because it is the one that shows up very, let's say, very nicely. Uh, uh, for the government, um, but still, say, ah, there are perhaps something which can be perhaps uh, changed here or modified, not even changed, modified to take into account this or that. Why not? We can see that, but we cannot say that from our, let's say, uh, uh, own perspective that something has to be done in terms of the advertising what we do. That's a good, a valid study on that. In terms also of uh, demonstrating, which is the most difficult, that there is no harm in the country, which is a, uh, the donor country, and there is no harm on the, let's say, on the risk of terrorist attacks. Because, of course, in this case, you go back to the first issue, the first challenge, which is to say, hey, uh, counterterrorist measures constitutes, constitute sorry, a right for, uh, I mean, it has been said by Navi Pillay, and it is uh, in the, uh, many of the uh, human rights declarations, they are, constitute a right for a person. So this is where, really, probably we have to engage in this work on the basis of this report more deeply to see how it is palatable. Is the, tomorrow we will not start to say, hey guys, you will challenge, change the decision. No, it cannot be that. I understand your point. What I say is that we have to start to define more, let's say precisely, what could be put eventually in a legislation, but we cannot start from scratch. We have also to have some elements to be put in the legislation. We have not yet these elements, so we have still time, madam. Just to say that I think um, there is already good discussion taking place. On a oh, good discussions taking place already in, in a number of areas. Um, for example, the example that I just given you about a specific clause about a specific donor in a specific country. Now, I think the idea is to then generate and scale up these good practices. And in the risk assessment area also, uh, for example, in Somalia, um, the Security Council has given us an exemption to the sanctions regime, uh, but the, the country team there then had uh, established a quite well-functioning risk assessment management system centering around the UN country team and resident coordinator. And we report back to the sanctions committee every year on how this uh, risk management system is working. And the committee has been very satisfied so far. And they have given us uh, it renewed this exemption on a yearly basis. So there is good practices uh, to, 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 to start from. And I think 
we wel we would welcome any any uh, arena or fora to further this discussion with member states uh, and groups or individuals. Um, and we're very grateful for uh, the representation here from certainly the Somali ambassador and and the, and the uh, Denmark mission. Um, this is really just uh, just to say we're here. We're, we want to discuss these issues. And we would be available, um, and certainly within the UN system, with the counterterrorism sector direct. Maybe we should travel together, uh, Mr. Laborde, <laughs> to those countries. Um, but very, very, very. Um, <laughs> and as I said already, within the IASC framework, which is the the humanitarian interagency standing committee, the coordination body, um, the work has uh, already already begun, um, and uh, we hope that this can be scaled up. Thank you. Jan? Yeah. Uh, uh, there is, of course, enormous agreement between uh, humanitarian organizations and governments of what is, what is the goal. The goal is to prevent terror, terror terrorist organizations, uh, that no way they can benefit directly or indirectly from humanitarian assistance. Uh, and I think there's also an understanding. I mean, I, I remember the days when there were diaspora groups sending money to Tamil Tigers and, uh, and some to groups in Somalia and so on. Of course, uh, you know, camouflage as if they were, you know, local humanitarian groups. But I mean, those are, I think that is very much of the past, and uh, at least those examples. And we're now talking about a lot of humanitarian organizations that have been d working in uh, with armed actors for a hundred years. I mean, some some of them. My own organization for sixty years. Uh, ICC for a hundred and whatever uh, years. Yeah, uh, exactly. So so and it's not. So it's not a new thing. It's, it's like as, as if it's a new thing. Oh, there are armed actors there, and you really have to be uh, uh, careful with the armed actors. So, well, I mean, Nazi Germany was also very bad. I mean, the, they, 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 there were hundreds of, of bad examples of, of bad places where good actors were doing good things for good, <coughs> vulnerable people. So, so in a way, I think a little bit we're reinventing the, the wheel here. We could go back to trying to find out, are you, are you good? Are, are you having procedures in place to avoid, in these circumstances, in any way, assisting uh, these very bad actors? And I, I'm, I'm again saying Syria is a place where we're all behind the curve. We're not even close to meeting the needs inside uh, Syria. We have to do an enormous amount or, or more. If, if we're going to have layers of different uh, criteria from different donors. Don't do this, look at this, here's a pilot project for this, you have to report on that, vet all of your people, etc. We will not be close to helping the people, neither in our Nusra areas or ISIS area or government control areas or Kurdish areas or, or, or FSA areas or whatever. And that's why we have to sit down and agree what is the fair, I completely agree with the Danish ambassador, also have defined, you know, or, or, um, the, the, there was a purpose for this uh, in the beginning. That purpose of counter-terror legislation has to be filled, and it was not to make it difficult uh, no. to, to help uh, women and children in, in, in these situations. And it is making it different. Yeah. Well, well to, you've got time for... Just one second, second. yes. Okay. Well, for Syria, there is no counter-terrorist measures which have been, uh, uh, let's say... But it could be the next pilot. Yeah, no, but uh, no, it's, not, it's not the situation at the moment, I would like to say, for the humanitarian. Hello. What I want to say is still we need to have, and this is my final word, sir, to recollect a little bit what we have. This is not to reinvent the wheel, but still we have to uh, put the cursor at the right place at the moment. And it's not because, we, you, as I said, we have still the uh, humanitarian law. It's good in principles to have also the uh, rights of people, you know, not to be uh, targeted by terrorists, which is also uh, a human rights, uh, a human right. So this is where we, I don't, I don't like to say balance because it's not the point. It is all part of, as I said, international rule of law. But we have really to be a little bit more precise. Otherwise, the people can be can be lost. On the principles, I agree with you, Jan. Uh, we should not reinvent the wheel, but still we have to be a little bit more precise because now we have legislation in place and we have to say 
to uh, the legislator, with, which was the question, what has to be, I mean, smoothly and, and uh, let's say, precisely changed in the legislation? That was for the answer to uh, my dear colleague that I just uh, make this reference. We have time for a few more. I start with Udo Jans here. Anybody else? We're going to give Udo Jans the last word. <laughs> Udo? I hope I still have a question and I want an answer. So <laughs> somebody will have the last word. But thanks very much to you and the panelists. This was great and goes a long way, as you said, uh, Kyung Wa, to open that dialogue and hopefully to continue it. I must say I liked your your concept of the unintended consequences, Jan, because it, it shows that there is a bona fide effort from both sides here at play. And that is a good starting point to overcome our ignorance from both angles, if you like. Yeah? And we know at heart you are a humanitarian anyway, Jean-Paul, so that is a good starting point too. Uh, but, you know, it needs to be, I mean, there is a learning curve here that we all have to, that we have to walk um, the walk instead of uh, keeping to the talk. Uh, when we are exposed to areas in which we try to work impartially, neutrally, to really base our assistance on need and nothing else than need, then clearly we need to be able to talk to groups that are the devil. We are ca often caught really between a rock and a hard place. The rock being the devil on the one side, the hard place really is the demands of donors and counterterrorism efforts that really don't help either to maintain that neutrality. When I look at what we have been trying to do from each vantage point in Afghanistan, I must say we both have issues to answer. If a general can publicly state that the humanitarian effort in the country is part and parcel of the counterinsurgency effort of the military, then really we are shooting ourselves in the foot from both sides. Similarly, if we want to maintain uh, credibility as humanitarian agencies, we need to be seen to really deliver impartially, and I think it was very good that you uh, uh, put the attendance uh, or the, the focus on Syria, Jan, because we are not credible if we cannot reach out to the population that is currently trapped, if you like, in the areas that are outside of government control and are under the control of and off warlords, individual groups in one form or another. We must make a credible effort to reach out and the only way to do that is to demonstrate that neutrality and impartiality on every, on every way where we can. Just a quick one on George who has unfortunately left. The <laughs> IPU is one of the oldest organizations, sister organizations, um, that we can deal with. Uh, and they have done fabulous work really to educate parliamentarians on a number of issues. UNHCR, for example, did a joint publication on international refugee law principles for parliamentarians. Uh, we have done a similar thing to combat statelessness through the IPU and published it with the IPU for parliamentarians of the world. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to do the same thing on counterterrorism and, in fact, humanitarian principles to educate parliamentarians that there are a few things that might be useful to know. So I think this is just a suggestion. But I would, I would invite everybody to maintain or to continue that dialogue that I think in many ways I don't think has started here. There have been areas before, as Teresa said, where we have sat together. And I, I do welcome that opportunity because we just need to do it. Uh, because we both make mistakes on either side of the divide. Thank you. Thank you, Udo. That does stand as a nice final comment. But let me ask the panelists individually if you'd like to add anything. This is the last chance. Well, just just uh, a little bit of an update on Syria. This is the crisis of the day for, for however you cut it politically. Um, Human rights, humanitarian, um, and as as much as the highlight uh, is on the in outcome of the um, chemical weapons investigation, um, uh, the 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 focus on the the very dire and and further deteriorating humanitarian situation should not be lost. And I'm very very grateful to the SG that that continues to be a key part of his message 
to the Security Council and to the GA this afternoon where he will be reporting on the chemical weapons investigation. Um, I've just heard Valerie saying now the number is 7 million uh, people affected and need, in need, 4.25 internally displaced, 2 million refugees. Uh, the funding situation is not good. 47% uh, funded uh, for the SHARP in, uh, inside Syria operations and 43% funded for the refugee response. Um, and, and we're now needing to release some funds from the SURF. Uh, I think 50 million already has been decided. Um, the uh, particular concern is on, as, you, as Udo says, there are besieged pockets of populations that have been totally cut off from any humanitarian access for, for many months, um, just in the rural Damascus area, where, which is the area of the, the 21st August uh, chemical weapons attack, um, estimates about 600,000 people. Um, uh, just uh, in areas controlled and, and, and uh, you know, wh whether it's the government or the, the opposition. One particular area, we had initially uh, agreement from the government to have access and to provide assistance, uh, but then the weapons attack happened. It's one, one area that is mentioned in the report of having been the, uh, the, the on-site investigation by the chemical weapons team. So just, just to illustrate how, how, how dire the situation is. And yes, there is now, you know, it's a great thing that they have the steel about the chemical weapons, uh, but, but, but the, the, we should not lose focus on, on the real dire and increasingly more dire needs of the, of the people of Syria inside and in the, in the neighboring countries. Thank you. Thank you. No, I mean, the, the only, the, what I will certainly take back as homework um, myself is that uh, my organization and our, our partners w uh, need to be uh, explaining, be even better in explaining the 150 internal and external monitoring mechanisms we are under that can uh, alleviate the fears of parliamentarians and, and ministries and governments that we are indeed never ever handing over any funds or any resources to any political group like that, because it would be end of our of our work. And ho and hopefully that is also you know our contribution to the dialogue that I look forward to. Uh, we'll Jean Paul and others uh, will uh, <laughs> will 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 initiate so yes. that we can reverse the unintended consequences of some understandable and well-intended legislation after 9-11 and what not. Jean-Paul. As I said, we start the dialogue, the dialogue now because we have a meeting in, uh, in what? Uh, in, in, uh, 15 minutes, in yeah. one hour? <laughs> so be sure that we will continue to do that. Um, well, um, still uh, CTITF, the Counterterrorism Implementation Task Force, has also started this dia dialogue since uh, OCHA is an observer in this uh, counterterrorism implementation task force. So uh, I, I really, uh, let's say, pushed for having uh, this, uh, this organization, I mean, this, uh, sorry, this uh, department of, of the UN uh, working on, uh, with us on that. And of course, this dialogue on these issues has started uh, and at that point to answer to what you say, and you, you know very well that, um, since you were there. Uh, but what I want to say is, uh, well, we are working all of the, all of us, as I said m several times, for an international rule of law which is fair, and uh, this is where probably we have to uh, show our determination as an example for the rest of the world. Thank you, Jean-Paul. I think, I'm happy to say, I think the dialogue has begun here at IPI, thanks to our powerhouse panel. Thanks to you all for coming. Thank you in particular to all three of you for a fascinating session.